can point the way to creating a more sustainable planet. Thank you for joining us today, David, and I will uh, turn it over to you. Thanks uh, very much, Dave, and uh, thank you everyone, not just for being here today, but for your ongoing work trying to uh, build more sustainable and livable cities. It's incredibly important, and if we are going to address climate change, I firmly believe it's in our urban areas that we will do so, and the work of the 2030 districts and the network is really important in achieving those goals. So. Thank you for, for being part of this. I am going to uh, share my screen once I get my PowerPoint up here. Um, ah, uh, Dave, can you enable screen sharing for me? It's not I enabled. apologize, yep. I think it's because I came in on the wrong link probably. Um, and I do uh, want to let people know if they would act, like to ask questions, please add them to the question and answer or the chat, and we'll uh, address them at the end of the speak, uh, the talk. Thank you. Okay, I think, is that uh, up now? It is, yes. Okay, here we go. So as Dave said, uh, I'm going to speak uh, to uh, my book, Solved, How the great, World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate Crisis. Um, but more particularly, I'm going to speak about what I've seen through my privileges uh, career as mayor um, and uh, with this international organization of the world's leading cities on the real climate action that is happening globally. And it's my, I wrote the book because, first of all, I don't think enough people understand the importance and um, inspiring nature of what's happening in cities on climate. And secondly, because uh, when I sat down to write it, it was a moment um, when people, I think, had lost faith in the world's ability to address climate change. And I wanted to show that there is a potential path uh, to success uh, if we choose it. Um, so uh, that's uh, why I wrote the book and what I'm going to talk about today essentially is what's happening in leading cities, why cities matter, a contrast to what's going on in national governments, um, and uh, speak specifically to the example of Toronto, not just because it's a 2030 district, but because Toronto has tremendously succeeded in dramatically uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, based on, on some of the strategies that I talk about in the book. Background, of course, and everybody here knows this, is we're really in trouble. And we're really in trouble, and we see it almost every week. And it's been interesting and daunting during COVID to see all the, the climate-related events that have been happening uh, pre, just pre-COVID, when the Australian wildfires were happening, there were biblical floods in Jakarta that nobody really knew about. We knew about them at C40 because Jakarta is one of our important members. But um, there were biblical levels of floods affecting some of the, the poorest people in the world. And the president of Indonesia has said Jakarta has to move, and it's a city of over 10 million people. How do you move a city like that? But because of... Uh, the increasing extreme weather linked to climate change and uh, sea level rise that's both anticipated and, and happening. So the situation is extremely serious. It's affecting everyone in different ways. Uh, very difficult for cities and towns to grapple with the impact of climate-related uh, extreme weather events, of course, in the middle of grappling with a uh, global pandemic. Um, and at home, uh, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian, obviously. Uh, I spend a good part of the year in British Columbia. Uh, this year was the worst wildfire season ever. It had been predicted previously by climate modeling that wildfires were going to get worse and more serious in British Columbia. That was predicted and predicted publicly. Um, and tragically, this year, uh, an entire small town, Lytton, British Columbia, burnt down in a very, very short period of time as the result of, of uh, the 
tinder-like conditions created by uh, much drier weather than, than normal and the risk of wildfires. So I ho hope, I assume all of that's not news to people, and I hope the next part isn't news either, what we need to do. What we need to do is to keep overall global average temperature rise to 1.5 degrees or less, and we're almost at one. And this is a chart of warming projections, and I find it extremely daunting and worrying because what science tells us is that today, based on what uh, nations are doing, we are projected to be somewhere around three degrees. Now, in Paris, six years ago, national governments agreed and, and made uh, pledges and made public pledges uh, in the intended nationally determined contributions, i.e. each country said this is our share, and it was anticipated that uh, there would be a ratcheting up process um, at COP26, which is going to happen this year in Glasgow, and I'll speak more to that in a minute. But even under those pledges, uh, we'll be lucky if we hold overall temperature increase to 2.4 degrees, um, and to be consistent, we need to dramatically drop emissions. Essentially, what has to happen, as you can see uh, by this graph, uh, we needed to have peaked emissions last year, certainly in the global north, maybe later in the global south, uh, have them by 2030 on a path to net zero by 2050. And that having by 2030 is incredibly important. Because from my perspective, what that means is if we are going to get on the kind of path we need to, to keep global temperature increases where they must be and must not exceed, which is 1.5 degrees, the next nine years, the next decade has to be the decade of climate action. And it has to build on things that we can do now. Having global emissions by 2030 is not going to succeed based on the idea of inventing new technologies. That may help between 2030 and 2050, um, uh, particularly you know issues around storage, which isn't really credible from my perspective at the moment. But what we need to do over this decade, the remainder of this decade, is do everything we can using something that works somewhere that has shown to be successful in reducing emissions. And from my perspective, that speaks to the importance of cities because what we will see through my talk is really strong examples of actions that are working somewhere based on currently available technologies or emerging technologies that have already been tried and work um, and, and therefore can uh, be likely to work at scale. And what we need to do is make sure those really excellent good practices that are done somewhere are done everywhere. Now, why do cities matter? Well, they matter for a variety of reasons. One is because today, unlike from uh, the start of human settlements until about 2008, 2009, so let's say the last decade, until the last decade, the world was a predominantly rural world. Today, um, starting from 2008, 2009, because of the growth of huge megacities in China, India, uh, and Latin America, and to some extent Africa, um, the world is an urban world. And that matters to how we think about addressing climate change, because in order to address it, you need to address it where the problem is and where uh, the solutions are found. So cities, about 55% of global population today, most of the world's economy is generated in cities. Most of the world's greenhouse gas emissions are generated in cities. Most of the energy is consumed. And they also have challenges. Most of the urban expansion in developing countries like in Jakarta is near hazard prone areas, hazard prone from the perspective of, of climate. So what this shows to me 
is that cities are where the people are, where the economy is, and where the greenhouse gas emissions predominantly are. Not all of them, but a huge proportion. And that also means cities are where the solutions can be. And there's been tremendous leadership of mayors over the past 15 years or so uh, in building solutions to climate change. And people sometimes ask me why mayors are active on this issue. And I think it's for a couple of structural reasons. One is that city governments in most places, and there are different forms of government. Uh, India is quite different than what we're used to in North America, for example. But city governments in, both, in most places tend to be very connected to their residents and citizens. Sometimes because of the structure of the government, and the way people are elected in small districts, um, sometimes because of the law like the Planning Act in Ontario, which actually requires public consultation on planning proposals. Therefore, cities get in the habit of engaging um, with, uh, with their residents. Um, but the polls are, are very clear and have been clear certainly since 2007 when Inconvenient Truth came out, but before that as well that people are extremely concerned about climate change and expect action. And that means in a form of government where there tends to be a real connection uh, with those same residents, there is very likely to be uh, action. A second reason is most cities have powers in areas that uh, can lead to reducing emissions. Some run their own uh, electricity, for example. Um, most have responsibility for transport or regulating transport, like taxis, public transport. Um, virtually all have very significant authority over where buildings can be built. Some have authority or have assumed it over how buildings can be built. Um, all have authority over waste management, which, which matters. And the third thing is, so th those are two structural things. The third structural thing from my perspective is that um, because cities are facing a changing climate and an increased frequency and severity of storms, there is a massive financial impact on them. So there's a financial incentive for cities to be part of the solution to climate change. From the perspective of Toronto, for example, one program we had to cope with the increasing flooding the city was having uh, between 2007 and, and 2010, which is my second term as mayor, uh, we had three 50-year storms, which of course are only supposed to happen every 50 years. And it was necessary for us to have a huge program to both replace our hard infrastructure and create green infrastructure to, to deal with these water challenges. One program, and there was more than one, was uh, going to cost a billion dollars. And at that time, the entire city's tax base was three billion. So massive, massive impact on city budgets. Imagine Houston, Toronto had 50 year storms. Houston uh, had 500 year storms. Uh, incredible impact there. And it might be the reason that Houston now uh, has a climate plan and the mayor is empowered to speak to climate. Uh, because people have seen the impact and they know that something is wrong. This photograph is uh, from the last C40 summit in Copenhagen, uh, uh, showing a variety of mayors. Mayor uh, Plant from Montreal is there in blue. Mayor Garcetti is the current chair, is right in the middle next to her. And Mayor Hidalgo from Paris uh, next to her. And then the mayor of Copenhagen next to her, who was our host. And the, the reason I'm have this photo here is just so I can mention that C40, um, if you don't know, is a network of 97 of the mayors of the world's largest cities, uh, with some smaller cities who are extreme, like Copenhagen, are extremely active on, on climate. And they work together for the sole purpose of addressing climate change. Uh, it was started by uh, then Mayor Ken Livingston uh, of London in uh, 2005 and his perspective was that the mayors of the biggest cities have the opportunity to use their actions and their voices 
to help the world avoid dangerous climate change. Um, and that's what they do. And there's some context to this. If we think back to the chart showing where we have to be, there is one national government in the world, the Gambia, that has an intended nationally determined contribution um, that is compatible with 1.5 degrees. That's it. There are some others that are almost sufficient and a lot that are insufficient and highly insufficient or critically insufficient. And it's a very significant worry in the run up to Glasgow this year because if national governments are not even prepared to pledge that they're going to do what's necessary, how are we as, as uh, citizens of the world going to ensure that the climate action we need happens? And my answer to that is I've personally um, lost the ability to believe that the international negotiations are going to be able to produce binding agreements that require countries to do what is necessary. And there's some reasons for that that I'll mention in a minute. So what we really need to rely on are actions, actions by cities, by uh, states and, and provinces and regions, actions by business, by trade unions and others. And really we need to seize the agenda in order to ensure that the world does everything necessary to get to 1.5 degrees. Um, why do I believe that uh, the international system isn't gonna produce the necessary outcome? Well, first of all, because COP26 this year in Glasgow is the 26th time national governments have met after declaring that climate change was real and had to be addressed. And they've essentially reached one agreement and it took 21 years to do that. And there are structural reasons for that because in the UN system, out of respect for national sovereignty, in this kind of negotiation, essentially everyone has to agree including on language. And it's my understanding that in the language negotiations, a country can bracket words uh, if it doesn't agree, and they're, they're bracketed for discussion. So imagine if there's a country like uh, Canada under Prime Minister Harper, uh, or Brazil under President Bolsonaro that wants to restrict climate action. It's extremely easy for them just to bracket words and say, I don't agree with those words and slow the negotiations down. And one of the reasons Paris was successful is because the French essentially didn't put up with that. Um, they were quite brilliant, by the way. They, they thought, how do we ensure these negotiations succeed? And they came up with two strategies. The first was they believed that the people negotiating needed to be happy. So in order for people who were shut in a room for two straight weeks to be happy, they needed at least to eat really well. So the food was absolutely incredible. Even the coffee was the best I'd ever seen. They drove these little tiny carts onto the floor and you, you had espresso from this little cart that was just nirvana. So they, they spoke to the, uh, the hearts of, of the delegates. And the second thing they did was they sort of collected everything at the end of the day and said, okay, we see where people are at. We're going to write this up and bring it back tomorrow. And they deliberately wrote things up and kept it going in a way that sort of forced people to give up on this bracketing approach and just forced through an agreement. Um, of course, very important that the U.S. and China and, and the small island states were on board ahead of time. But the French were really quite brilliant. But that's the only time these negotiations have really worked. Now, we'll be in Glasgow in four weeks and you know hopefully there's a breakthrough but um i i think the signs aren't good and i i think perhaps it's time to move on from thinking we need more agreements we already have paris what we really need is to ensure that there is sufficient action happening over the next decade to do our share of halving emissions and that to me speaks to the role of cities after Paris, the C40 cities in their next summit, which was in Mexico City, agreed 
that it, that those cities would need to do their share of what Paris required. So their share of having emissions by 2030, their share of net zero by 2050 on a pathway to 1.5 degrees. And by the way, at that time, national governments were all talking about two degrees. 1.5 was considered to be the higher ambition of Paris, even though science then showed that's what was necessary. What these mayors did was um, agree that they would do what science required. And by the way, the 97 C40 cities, the regions that those cities are hearts of, consist of about 750 million people and something close to 25% of the world's GDP. So they're extremely influential. And these mayors agreeing to do their part of 1.5 degrees is very important. And so they, they set their targets. Uh, it came about using the carbon budget system um, and uh, agreed that in order to remain a member of C40, you had to have a plan to do your share of, of having by 2030 on a path to net zero to 2050. And the good news is, um, most of the cities today have such a plan and are implementing it. Uh, some haven't got there yet, particularly uh, some cities in Africa. Uh, COVID really diminished, the, dealing with COVID diminished their capacity, uh, but it's well, well on its way. And about half of the cities, including Toronto, have already peaked emissions. So those cities have moved from planning to action, um, really significant action. And studies show, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that about 70% of the greenhouse gases in cities or in the world come from cities. Those greenhouse gases, the city share, predominantly come from how we generate our electricity, um, how we heat and cool our buildings, transportation, and waste. And in each of those areas, there are very significant actions happening today that are helping to dramatically lower greenhouse gas emissions and getting the cities that they're in that are undertaking those actions on a path uh, to having by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Energy, there are some interesting examples, both of cities who run their own utility and those who don't who are still taking leadership uh, to change their electricity grid into clean energy through their purchasing power and their moral suasion and the bully pulpit of the mayor. But good examples of cities that are using their legal power are Los Angeles and Austin. Uh, Los Angeles um, is uh, uh, through the Department of Water and Power, which is a, a city department, uh, wholly owned by the city, obviously, is dramatically changing its energy supply. Um, it will be at about 95%, uh, I believe, clean energy by 2030 on a way to 100% electricity created by clean energy uh, in 2035. And they've had their plans reviewed by uh, the federal government, the Department of Energy. It's clear they're real. They're phasing out the use of uh, coal and other fossil fuels um, and phasing in solar and other clean energy. And by the way, people might think it's easy for Los Angeles because it's California and California is very progressive. Los Angeles is actually an oil field. And when you go to Los Angeles, you will see iron horses in lots next to people's homes. It's that much of an oil field. So, it's an oil town. We don't think of it as an oil town like Houston, but it is. So for it to be taking these kinds of measures uh, is really bold and also confirmation that people are ready and want this change. Austin, Texas has done a couple of interesting things. The first was a few years ago. Uh, Austin has been booming because it's um, a place with uh, excellent universities, a lot of creativity, uh, the kind of place uh, where a lot of young people will move to. And as a result of that boom, it faced pressure to build a new electricity plant 
uh, to serve its population growth. And rather than um, build a plant, which would have been in all likelihood fossil fuel fired because of uh, the rules in Texas at the time, uh, it decided instead to have its city-owned utility, although it's an arm's length uh, corporation, it's, it's owned by the city, pay people to insulate their houses to use less electricity. And in doing that, they ended up being successful, avoiding the need for a new power plant and spent less money than doing the insulation subsidies that would have cost to build the power plant in the first place. Uh, they're going through a similar challenge again. And now what they're doing, instead of subsidizing the, the retrofits because they had huge success with that and they needed a new strategy, they're subsidizing uh, sol rooftop solar in single family homes to supplement the electricity grid and, and start to get on the path to a distributed uh, energy grid. Really powerful examples. Sydney and Melbourne, Australia are also really interesting um, because they don't have these kinds of powers. So what they've done is create uh, buying co-ops, taking the city's need for energy, which is significant when you think about uh, you know, electric-based transportation, like uh, subways and trams, for example, um, uh, and other big institutions like hospitals, and they've gone to the market and said, we're only buying clean energy. And as a result of that, in Sydney, for example, there are huge solar arrays that have been and are being built outside the city to supply clean energy because the city took the decision to be 24-7 on clean energy um, and dramatically reduce the reliance on, on fossil fuels. And then there's Toronto. Toronto um, owns its own utility, but it's a distribution utility. They did a study in 2010 showing how you could change the electricity system to a distributed energy system based on small local generation like rooftop solar that unfortunately hasn't proceeded because the provincial regulator is stopping it. But I think it's an important point to know that in our context, in a city with a climate like Toronto's, which is pretty cold in the winter um, and very hot in the summer, there is a way to change the grid to be distributed energy relying on uh, renewables, which is important in Toronto's case, not so much for the cleanliness because the Ontario grid now is pretty clean, very little reliance on fossil fuels, mostly hydro and a little bit of nuclear, but because uh, it produces a far more resilient uh, city in the face of shocks. And that's extremely important, uh, as we discovered in 2003 when the, the grid went down the northeast of, of Canada. And the photos of Exhibition Place, which is a, a net zero consumer of electricity through solar, wind, and a highly efficient uh, tri-generator that generates as much electricity on site um, as, uh, as it consumes. Um, second area is buildings, and I think everybody on this call is more of an expert on buildings uh, than I am, but there's two parts to, to the issue around buildings. The first, of course, is we need to build cities that um, understand that sprawl is extremely bad for the environment in a variety of ways. And we need to ensure that our cities are built in a, a dense kind of uh, format uh, and our, our planning rules and regulations encourage that density, ideally around a really good backbone of public transit. But we also need to ensure that our buildings themselves uh, are low or zero carbon. And there's three initiatives that, uh, that uh, if replicated uh, globally, would really um, dramatically reduce emissions. And by the way, as, as you probably know, in many cities, how we heat and cool buildings is the single biggest source of um, greenhouse gas emissions. New York is now around 70%, used to be 80 uh, it's lowered because of some measures the, the city took. Um, Toronto's around 40. It used to be 60. It's lowered because of some measures the city took. 
uh, but re really, uh, really significant, particularly in the denser cities in which transportation is relatively less. So what's happening globally? Well, Vancouver has a building code that's going to require all buildings to be built to, to net zero operation by 2030. New York City has done two things under May Mike Bloomberg. It required commercial buildings over a certain size. Those were the buildings that, that contributed uh, to global to uh, climate change uh, the most. It required them to post their energy consumption on the theory that if the tenants knew they're in an inefficient building, they would force the landlord uh, to do the necessary work to change it because the tenants generally are responsible for the costs. That program was highly successful, but only in the highest class uh, office buildings. In uh, the lower classes, the tenants tended not to think they were going to be there as long, and often the owners didn't have as long term a view of, of owning the buildings as well. Um, the, the poster child for all of this is the Empire State Building, which had not one, but two massive energy retrofits the first one of which was over $120 million US. I believe the second one was a similar amount. And the owner said, I'm doing this for good business reasons because uh, I'm uh, gonna keep really good tenants and it's gonna pay for itself. And I'm glad I'm doing the right thing, but I'm doing it for financial reasons first. Um, to combat the issue that that effect is really only best in the flagship buildings. Um, the current administration, Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York, has passed a mandate saying that commercial buildings, and eventually it will be apartment buildings once they sort out uh, how to deal with rent control, um, the building, uh, again, over a certain size, but the ones that have an impact, will have to half their greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And they're also, um, uh, they also created a green jobs core to recruit young people to train them in those professions uh, in order to get the jobs, particularly young people from lower income neighborhoods. Now that got suspended because of COVID, but the link between jobs and uh, particularly opportunity for young people from low income neighborhoods and successful climate strategy is an important one. And I'll come back to that in, in a little bit. Third example is Oslo, who's leading a global push uh, to have uh, net zero or zero, near zero construction of buildings, which is about revolutionizing the materials, how we build buildings using low carbon concrete, all sorts of things. Really a big challenge, uh, but they're leading the charge. So between the three um, cities, uh, we have clean construction, uh, we have requirements around new buildings, and we have a significant program to address uh, older buildings. Now, in some places don't have the legal mandate of New York. Uh, Toronto, Melbourne, and Sydney, for example, have very significant voluntary programs with the private sector, with building owners. Um, in Toronto, it's called the Better Buildings Partnership. In Melbourne, it's called the Better Buildings Partnership because the then mayor heard me giving a speech about the Better Buildings Partnership at a C40 event and decided it was such a good idea, he was just gonna completely steal it, which is the other reason that city-based climate solutions work because uh, there's an active way of sharing ideas, best ideas and best practices, and they spread globally. Um, now, of course, one place we really need to see um, new buildings in particular op uh, operate and be built to the highest low carbon standards is China. Uh, but there is significant work being done with cities in China on these issues. And I think we can be hopeful um, that uh, uh, China will be seen as uh, a beacon of positive change in that area. It really does need to be given the incredible magnitude of the number of buildings being built, uh, being built there. Uh, next issue is transportation. I mentioned the importance of building a city uh, around public transport. We've seen in COVID the uh, rapid increase in the idea of 15-minute cities 
particularly from cities like Barcelona, Bogota. I think Buenos Aires has been talking about this. Um, uh, Montreal, a lot of the elements. Basically, the idea that we need to to allow our cities to grow in a way that ensures that people have all of the services they need within 15 minutes of their house, you know, including uh, work, shopping, education, recreation, green space. And that means the city needs an excellent public transport backbone, but also needs to give appropriate uh, and more space to active transportation like walking and cycling. And we've seen a lot of initiatives uh, around that. Uh, uh, COVID, the response to COVID seems to have really sped up the implementation of, of biking and the thinking about how to grow a city. And this, to me, the 15 minute city, first of all, tr traces its origins back to Jane Jacobs. If you read about how she saw the best cities and the best neighborhoods working, she felt you needed people working and living in the same neighborhood so that small businesses, for example, would succeed. Um, but it, it it's also an idea that at its heart speaks to having cities that are relatively dense, like London, Paris, Berlin, New York, and the, the core of a lot of other Cities. And it's going to be interesting to see if we can achieve that in in suburban areas going forward. Really uh, important and significant backdrop to transportation, because of course, if you build uh, cities that are 15 minute cities, it changes your transportation requirements. Um, notwithstanding that, mass transit is still really critical and will be critical. Ridership is down at the moment because of COVID. But having cities where people feel able not to have to have a car or not to have to use it is absolutely critical. And so there's some leading examples of, of building mass transit. Um, Lisbon in Portugal and Medellin in Colombia, as part of their COVID response, are building mass transit. Uh, Addis Ababa, pre-COVID, built the first light rail network in sub-Saharan Africa. And they conceived of it, got funding, built it, and started conceiving of extensions to it in the time that many North American cities were debating about whether they should do light rail or not. So, you know, sometimes at least my bias was to think, oh, we have all this knowledge. Let's go take it and tell the world. It's actually the other way around. We can learn an awful lot from cities in places like, like Africa. And one thing in particular, uh, Addis got an award from the C40 for their, their light rail. Um, and a couple of interesting things about it from an equity perspective. One is, in thinking about where the system should go, they looked at who were the biggest number of riders of the system it was replacing, which was essentially small uh, buses in the kind of informal transit, jitneys. And uh, it was mostly women. So they asked themselves the question, where are the women going? What are their needs? Um, what do women do during the day? Uh, you know, do they have childcare obligations before and after work, for example? Do they have special you know, health responsibilities in their family? And I am pretty certain that no North American transit route has been designed around the needs uh, of women in the way that was incorporated in the planning and, and thinking in Addis. So it's, it's really, uh, Really fascinating. A second really important movement that should be done everywhere and can be is the electrification of transit, starting with the electrification of all public transit. And by the way, of course, this light rail is electric in Addis and it's it's powered by a clean grid. Um, but we need to convert our bus fleets, our other fleets like taxi and lift and those kinds of fleets, uh, the post office, um, couriers all need to be electric and all can be. And we know this because uh, Chinese cities have shown it's true. Shenzhen, China, its entire bus fleet, and it has over 16,000 buses, is electric. Its entire taxi fleet is electric. And, the, and studies by Bloomberg New Energy have shown that the life cycle cost of an electric bus in the North American context in a busy uh, transit system 
is now lower than a diesel bus because there's much less maintenance. There are fewer parts to have to maintain. So it's affordable and it's technically feasible, yet we're seeing very slow progress to uh, changing um, uh, our bus fleets to electric and even slower progress on other fleets like the post offices and in taxis. And there's literally no reason financially or economically or technically, uh, it's a choice we can make, whether we take climate change seriously enough to electrify our transportation system. And there's really good working examples, electric cabs in London, England, to give uh, uh, a, a Western example, not just a Chinese one. Uh, Bogota has just bought uh, 1,200 electric buses, Santiago, Chile. Um, and we're taking tentative steps in North America. We need to be bold. Final issue is waste, and I won't spend too much time in that for this presentation, simply to say that ensuring methane doesn't escape from our waste management systems is really critical. And in Africa, this is often the number one contribution that cities can make to climate change, because many cities, particularly in um, the low-income informal communities outside the city uh, have an informal waste system with informal dumps, and those dumps leak methane very badly. So um, we've, we've seen cities like Accra uh, create proper landfills and find a path for the workers who are working in the informal sector to work in that landfill and then capture uh, the methane. Um, and even using it as a fuel is far less polluting from a climate change perspective than simply allowing it to get into the atmosphere uh, directly. And that's a really important. Many North American cities like Toronto and San Francisco in particular are doing pretty well uh, on composting the waste, um, uh, the wet waste, and separating it. Really critically important. Um, Final point I want to make, and then I'm just going to briefly speak to Toronto to show how this all comes together, is that all of this action has to be equitable. And the best climate plans of these mayors uh, ensure that climate action is equitable. And I've named a few examples, mentioned a few examples, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that it's the right thing to do. But the second thing is, unless you engage the people who are going to be impacted by these policies a, in a way that ensures that they know they have a say over them and their needs are going to be met, you aren't going to succeed politically in addressing climate change. And this is particularly important uh, when dealing with people who are employed in industries where there are going to be job losses. So the city cities need to be seen to be leading a just transition and need to actually be leading a just transition. And C40 is running pilot projects right now in Los Angeles, uh, Warsaw, Barcelona, and in five African cities in Africa working with um, the biggest trade union and uh, um, the electricity utility as well as the, as well as the cities to work on a just transition away from coal because their electricity is primarily coal. And if people don't see that their futures are protected, they're gonna fight really hard. And so it's in the self interest of climate activists to ensure that uh, climate action is equitable and is seen to be equitable and people see that they've had a part in developing the action really critical. Lots of interesting policies, particularly in cities like Los Angeles, around particular equity initiatives. But the key for me is to engage people at the beginning so that they can credibly know that they have a say, not a veto, but a say, a meaningful say that their needs will be addressed. So how does this all come together? Toronto is a good example and the one I use because I know it best. In 2007, we passed our first climate plan called Changes in the Air. Uh, it passed city council unanimously. And at that time, there were 44 city councillors, one mayor, um, and uh, there were no parties. So people came from all different perspectives, pretty far right, pretty far left, and everything in between. And for it to pass unanimously spoke to the fact that those councillors 
we're hearing from their constituents, whether they were right-wing counselors, left-wing counselors, or middle-of-the-road counselors, they were hearing from their constituents that they wanted the city uh, to lead on uh, climate. And so the, the unanimity spoke, I think, to that point I made earlier, that one of the reasons that cities are are great places for climate action is because people want that action and express it very directly to their elected representatives. And I know um, this was unanimous, A, because it was, but B, because I remember the vote because everybody was in their seat, because the next vote was about creating new taxes, particularly a land transfer tax. And as you might understand, that was not unanimous, although it did pass. And that new land transfer tax has supported the fiscal stability of, of Toronto for the last uh, 14 years. So Toronto had a plan. The plan addressed these sectors. For example, it had um, the uh, biggest um, uh, light rail expansion in North America as part of the plan. That's where it first got its approval. It had all sorts of programs to address buildings beyond the Better Buildings Partnership. There were internal funds designated to address city buildings. There were subsidies for uh, the arts and so forth to address their buildings. There were programs in low-income communities where we actually hired people to go, it was called Live Green Toronto, go to those communities and work with people to create projects, whether it was uh, community clean energy or community uh, uh, allotments to grow food and, and build community or uh, energy saving projects. People would create the projects themselves with the support of the city, and there was a grants program as well uh, that they could apply for if the projects were properly uh, structured. So addressing all of these kinds of things through a whole range of programs. Um, second, in the, uh, the plan was successful. It uh, uh, was intended to be renewed after five years. Uh, unfortunately, my successor uh, wasn't uh, as interested in climate, didn't undo any of the actions really, although the transit expansion was, was slowed down over political fights about technology, um, but didn't bring in place a, a second plan. Uh, however, uh, his successor has now brought in a, a new plan called Transform TO that picks up on the themes. Um, and at, as of today, Toronto's greenhouse gas emissions for the geographic area of Toronto that you can see in the transit city map and the priority investment neighborhoods map is now 33% are now 33% below what they were in 1990. And that's as a result of the 2007 plan and the provincial closing of a coal fired plant uh, that uh, delivered Toronto's electricity. It was a peaking plant predominantly for mostly for uh, air conditioning in the summer. Um, but that's how powerful a city plan can be. Um, massive reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. It's a little bit stalled and Toronto needs to, to do some more, but I don't think that's the point of today's talk. It's about what is possible. And I just wanted to show these last two slides to knit this all together because the best climate plans think about these issues holistically. So the light rail plan, which was called Transit City, is there. It's light rail at grade running down the middle of the street, uh, except for one section of the Eglinton line, which had to be tunneled because it was through a very dense uh, area and it wouldn't fit above ground. Um, that plan was first conceived as an idea in the climate plan. It was then developed by the Transit Authority in partnership with uh, our planners to say where exactly should the lines be? And the Toronto Transit Commission uh, wanted the lines to be where the busiest bus routes were because they needed to move to rapid transit. And the planners wanted the lines to be where we could welcome growth into the city. They call these major roads avenues in the official plan as a bulwark against urban sprawl and some of the challenges it brings environmentally, socially, economically and from a transportation perspective. So this was a climate strategy that was also a transportation plan, a development plan, and as I'll show you in a minute, was also a social justice plan. And um, what the, the, and the plan started construction, Eglinton is just about uh, finished, Shepherd started and was stopped, 
Etobicoke Finch is finally about to start now, and the line label of Scarborough Malvern has been renamed uh, and is on the books to start soon. And the Don Mills line has also been renamed, but it's it's on the books uh, to start soon as well. So um, even though it's taken much longer than originally contemplated, this would all have been finished by 2021 on the original timelines and with the original funding. Uh, it, the robust nature of planning around transportation needs and planning needs has stood the test of time. Now, who rides the bus? mostly in a North American city, the busiest bus routes tend to be bus routes that link up, uh, that serve at least low-income neighborhoods. So the other chart, you're seeing what we call priority investment neighborhoods. So Toronto did a study in partnership with the United Way, the provincial government and others to say where, what, what neighborhoods in this city are neighborhoods that have the highest correlation between low incomes and a lack of public services. Public services like libraries, community centers, job training programs for youth, opportunity for work, those kinds of things. And it created this list of neighborhoods that became a priority for public investment. So within the city budget, we prioritize these neighborhoods. So if we're gonna build a library, First chance, a new library first chance would be to a neighborhood like Steele's, Lamaru, or Melbourne. And if you look at these priority neighborhoods and the transit city routes, the transit city routes more or less exactly serve these neighborhoods. And that's no coincidence, of course, because it's the people who live there that tend to commute by bus because it's extremely expensive uh, to, to commute by car. And in Toronto's case, about a half our transit ridership is off peak as well. People doing things like shopping. It's a regular service. It's not just a commuting service. And low income people tend to do a lot of their regular daily business by bus as well. Again, because it's often expensive to run a car, certainly to park it. So the transit city plan, which started as a climate plan, also became a social integration plan. And the importance of that was illustrated when we were doing our public consultations. And as part of those consultations, I rode the Shepherd East bus one morning at about 6 a.m. I had an assistant named Clyde who lived just north of the E on Shepherd East. It's in the Malvern area that you know, is a priority neighborhood. And uh, we took the Malvern bus down to Shepherd. And on the Shepherd bus, I went over to a woman who was sitting there who'd been on the Malvern bus. And uh, she said, Mayor, what are you doing on my bus at six o'clock in the morning? And I said, I've come to talk to you about the Shepherd East LRT. And she said, what's an LRT? And I said, well, it's a European style tram that runs down the middle of the street in its own right of way. So it doesn't get stuck in rush hour traffic, unlike the bus. So its service is more regular and it's faster and it'll get you where you're going on time. And she said, that would be great for me. And I said, where are you going? She said, to work. Where do you work? Pearson Airport. Pearson Airport is underneath the Transit City button. From where she got on the bus, that's about 30 miles. How do you get there? Well, I take the Malvern bus, the Shepherd bus, the subway, the subway, the Finch bus, and then the Malton bus. I said, that's a long trip. And she said, yes, it's two hours if I make my connection. In winter, sometimes I miss them. And I said, you have a long day. And she said, Mayor, that's only my morning job. In the afternoons, I'm a cleaner at the Royal York Hotel. The Royal York Hotel is right downtown. So she would go bus, bus, subway downtown, and then subway, subway, bus, bus to get home. She probably spent well over four hours a day on the bus. If she had access to rapid transit, it would radically change that possibility. She, she might uh, only spend two and a half hours a day, maybe even three. But if she had an hour back, what could she do with that hour? Well, she could have dinner with her family. She could do what my mom did. My mom went back to school and graduated at the age of six, uh, 56 and was able, because of that, um, to, to get a significant pay increase and a much better job. Maybe she could go back to school. Centennial College is very close to where she lives. Maybe she could go back to college and upgrade her skills so she could have a full-time job, one job instead of two and then spend far less time uh, commuting. Or maybe 
she could use that hour in the evening to go to public meetings about transit and speak up and participate in the democratic life of Toronto and say, I want Shepherd East built because it's going to change my life. Whatever she did, this transportation plan would dramatically change her ability to be part of the life of the city and to have opportunity and to have a, a better and more meaningful family life. And that plan came directly from a climate strategy. And that's why I'm optimistic about the potential of city-based climate action, not just because of the technical areas that I spoke to in this presentation, but because at its best, the, those, these plans solve multiple problems for people, particularly the problem of equity and inclusion. And that's a challenge that every single mayor uh, wants to surmount. And by doing the right kind of climate uh, plan, he or she can. That's what I wanted to say today. I've been slightly longer than I meant, Dave. I apologize about that. And I look forward to the questions. Great. Thank you uh, very much, David. This is incredibly valuable. Great to, uh, great to hear uh, about some of the successes around, uh, around the world. Um, I do have a couple of real quick questions. I know we're pressing up against time, but uh, one question that came in, um, how has C40 addressed the grid reliability issue and aging electric distribution infrastructure? Is that something that C40 has gotten involved in? It's a very good question. The answer is uh, no, but we will be. Um, the way C40 often works is our mayors create a declaration, which is kind of a statement of ambition, and then we create programs to support it. And we just uh, last month launched in uh, Climate Week, so two weeks ago, launched our energy declaration. It's a really big issue. My personal view is uh, it's an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to switch to a much more distributed energy system um, uh, as uh, they seem to be working on in Austin. But we, we don't, we haven't done significant, some of our cities probably have, but we haven't done significant work on that yet. It's a huge issue. It's a great question. And it's certainly a very big issue in Toronto, which has two electricity lines. It's the heart of Canada's economy. Uh, one in five jobs is within an hour's drive of Toronto City Hall in Canada. And it's only got two electricity lines coming into it. It really needs to update the grid and to have a distributed energy system. Um, and uh, it's had a huge challenges because of the, the regulatory system in trying to do that. Great, thank you. I mean, again, we don't have much time. I thought I'd one more question here, uh, really uh, targeted towards uh, most of the audience that's on the, on the line right now. But beyond the actions that some of our uh, building owners, uh, managers can take in their own buildings, what actions can members um, take to help change policy at a at a city level to to really start uh, seeing some action at uh, at the municipal level in, in their cities your actions matter your actual actions really matter a lot because they're examples and they make it easier for others um, so i uh, encourage you to continue on those actions e even including um kind of forgotten the word but uh properly making sure the systems in the buildings work because that's a low-hanging fruit of five or six percent reduction in energy use. Um, second set of actions, I encourage you to use technologies that are developed now and exist and cutting edge, but haven't been used enough. Um, so, you know, there's low, low carbon concrete. There's a shark out of Vancouver, which uses uh, the heat from wastewater to heat and cool buildings. Very interesting example. Perfectly commercial, but needs a boost. So finding those examples of newer things that need a boost and using them will be very helpful. And I think using your voice, you know, building owners, suppliers, architects, your voice is really, really powerful. Um, and, you know, usually when people say, what can I do as an individual? I say, use your actions, use your voice, use your vote. Um, I, I think build on your actions and really use your voice, particularly in cities where maybe the city hall is a little a little nervous. Um, and one of the things you can say is, look, we'll bring in a great presentation from somebody from you know, C40 or anybody. We'll bring in a great presentation and help you see what's, what's possible. Your voices can really 
change the public discourse in places where either urgency is needed or new energy. Great, thank you very much. And again, we're, we're up against time. We've even gone a little bit long, so I appreciate everyone uh, sticking around for a few extra minutes. And again, uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, David, for presenting to this group. And, uh, and uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, working with C40 at, at the 2030 Networks and, uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.